to move the planet. Did you ever wonder why the 750 Supersport green frame is being regarded as the holy grail of motorcycles? Well, since we have here not one, not two, but three original Supersport green frames finished after restoration, we thought about making this definitive video about the 750 Supersport. So be sure to stick around till the end to know everything there is to know about these great motorcycles. Welcome to another video here at Back to Classics. It's all about the green frame and in order to tell that story we need to go back and dive into the history of Ducati a little bit. Uh, things we've done before on this YouTube channel of course, but we'll uh, go over them in overview uh, and eventually coming to the 750 Supersport of 1974. By the early 1970s, Ducati had established itself as a force in endurance racing and mid-sized competitions with their single-cylinder platform. But they had their sights set on an even bigger goal, entering the growing market segment for larger displacement motorcycles. Ducati's engineers, led by Taglioni, worked on a revolutionary new engine design, the 90-degree L-Twin. This engine configuration would soon become the heart of Ducati's future. The new L-Twin was simultaneously developed as a 500 Grand Prix racing bike and a 750 road bike. The Ducati 500 Grand Prix was a bold new venture that would bring the company into the highly competitive 500cc class, the pinnacle of motorcycle racing at the time. The 500 Grand Prix was a twin cylinder which, of course, featured Ducati's desmodromic valve actuation. But entering Grand Prix racing wasn't without challenges. While the 500 Grand Prix showed promise, it faced fierce competition from established manufacturers like Yamaha and MV Agusta, whose bikes often dominated the podium. Ducati's two-cylinder engine struggled to match the outright power and speed of the four-cylinder and two-stroke competitors. Despite the best efforts of Ducati's engineers and riders, the 500 Grand Prix struggled to find consistent success on the track. Mechanical issues and the sheer difficulty of competing at the highest level of motorcycle racing meant that Ducati's 500 Grand Prix project was ultimately short-lived. By 1972, it was clear that the 500 Grand Prix could not bring Ducati the success they had hoped for in Grand Prix Arena. But the whole endeavor wasn't without value. The lesson learned during this period, particularly in engine development and chassis design, would go on to influence future Ducati models, including their legendary production bikes. The 500 Grand Prix remains an important chapter in Ducati's racing history, showcasing their willingness to take risk and innovate, even in the face of adversity. It was a stepping stone that helped shape Ducati's future in performance and racing. While the 500 Grand Prix bike was being developed and raced, Daglioni also focused on street applications. It meant that Ducati would become a competitor in the market for large displacement motorcycles, a market where the new Ducati management saw the future of the company, and rightly so. In 1971, Ducati was ready to introduce the 750 GT a bike that would go down in history as the first large displacement Ducati. The 750 GT was powerful, reliable and unmistakably a Ducati with handling characteristics that were truly groundbreaking at the time. A sportier version of the 750 GT completed the Ducati lineup in 1972, the Ducati 750 Sport. The 750 Sport's design was unmistakably influenced by Ducati's racing heritage. It featured lower handlebars and rear set foot packs for a more aggressive riding position. With its bright yellow paint scheme with racing stripes and streamlined shape, the 750 Sport exudes pure performance. We now take for granted that Ducati is known for speed and superb handling, but at the time Ducati still had to make a name for itself in this growing and more lucrative segment of the market. In 1972, the needed breakthrough came when Ducati made history at one of the most prestigious and challenging endurance races in Europe, the Imola 200. This race, often referred to as the European Daytona, attracted the best teams and riders from around the world. And it marked Ducati's first real attempt to compete in the heavyweight, high-performance category. Ducati had been working to develop a completely new racing bike for this event, the Ducati 750 Imola Desmo. Based on the 750 GT, this bike was specifically designed for endurance racing. It featured the normal 90-degree 750 L-Twin engine, which was highly tuned for racing and, of course, featured Ducati's Desmo system. Ducati entered four 750s at Imola to be piloted by Bruno Spaggiari, Hermano Giuliano, Alan Dunscombe and Paul Smart. 
Smart, a talented racer with international experience, was initially reluctant to join Ducati, but after some convincing and a hefty cash bonus, he agreed to take part. It would prove to be the race that defined his career. On April 23, 1972, the starting flag dropped and the 200-mile battle began in front of 70,000 spectators. The Imola 200 was notorious for testing endurance with bikes needed to maintain peak performance for over 300 kilometers. Ducati's new 750 engine, with its balance of power and reliability, proved to be the perfect machine for the task, certainly helped by Taglioni's efforts to tune the racing bike to suit the Imola racetrack perfectly. From the outset, it was clear that Ducati had built something special. Smart and Spagiari quickly pulled ahead of the pack, their 750 Desmos performing with incredible precision and consistency. Despite the fierce competition from established brands like Honda and MV Agusta, the Ducati 750 showcased not only raw power, but superior handling, giving the riders an edge through Imola's tight turns and sweeping straights. Spagiari and Smart battled for first and second place for most of the race, even pitting together for fuel. By the end of the race, both riders were low on fuel and the machine started misfiring. Smart crossed the line victoriously, but only seconds in front of Spagiari, who was now running on one cylinder due to fuel starvation. The Ducatis proved to be so dominant that Walter Silva in third place was a full 25 seconds behind Spagiari. The historic 1-2 finish at the Imola 200 was a victory that shocked the racing world and solidified Ducatis place as a premier racing brand. The 1972 victory at Imola is often regarded as the race that put Ducati on the map. It introduced the world to the potential of Ducati's L-twin engine and the innovation of dismodromic technology. This victory laid the foundation for decades of racing success and inspired many future models. Following Ducati's historic 1-2 finish at the Imola 200, the company found itself at a crossroad. Ducati knew that they had captured lightning in a bottle and the next logical step was to bring the spirit of Imola to the road. This became the legendary 1974 Ducati 750 Supersport, also known as the Green Frame. The 750 Supersport was directly inspired by the machines that had conquered Imola with several key features lifted straight from the race-winning motorcycles. The 750 Supersport was inspired by this Ducati Imola racing bike and shared a lot of its DNA, bringing that raw performance to everyday riders. Although the 750 Supersport engine was largely based on that of the 750 GT, just like the Imola racing bike had done before, it now featured desmodromic valve actuation for the first time on a Street 750 L-Twin. But the 750 Supersport was more than just a machine of pure performance. It became a design icon. Known as the green frame for its striking green painted frame, the bike's aesthetics were as bold as its engineering. Its sleek minimalist bodywork matched with the green frame and silver fuel tank made it one of the most visually recognizable motorcycles of its era. The decision to use a green frame was as daring as Ducati's approach to engineering. It gave the bike a unique look that stood out from the crowd and has since made it one of the most sought after collector's items in motorcycle history. The engine and frame number sequence allow for a total of 401 units to have been built in 1974. It is likely, however, that a lot less actually left the factory. The impact the bike made when it came to market and the fact that they are something very special and rare makes that the bike is so valuable and sought after today. The 1974 750 Supersport became a defining model for Ducati, cementing the company's reputation as a manufacturer that could seamlessly blend racing performance with road-going practicality. The Imola 200 may have been the victory that put Ducati on the map, but it was the 750 Supersport that carried that winning spirit into the hands of everyday riders. The green frame 750 Supersport laid the foundation for future Ducati sport bikes. From the 900 Supersport to today's high performance machines, it set the standard for what a Ducati should be. Fast, beautiful and engineered with racing in its blood. The 1974 Ducati 750 Supersport wasn't just a tribute to Imola, it was the embodiment of Ducati's philosophy of bringing the racetrack to the road. Even today, its legacy lives on, a symbol of Ducati's relentless pursuit of performance and innovation. Now, what makes the 750 Supersport of 1974 so special? Prepare for some nerdy content in this chapter as we will dive into all the little details of this model. If you can't handle it, skip to the next one because we're going to discuss all the little details that make up a 750 Supersport. 
Okay, people, let's start with the engine, the glorious 750 round case engine we were talking about earlier. Uh, of course, Stirl started with a 750 GT, later the Sport, and ultimately this Super Sport version. Uh, and the biggest difference we find are the cylinder heads, because this actually is the first V-twin made by Ducati, the first 750 V-twin to feature desmodromic valve actuation. Uh, also talked about that earlier, well, there's a lot to tell about this uh, cylinder head design, and we will go over that in more detail. So the cylinder heads were specifically designed for the 750 Supersport and were the first to uh, have the desmodromic valve actuation with a uh, set of specially designed rockers, opening and closing rockers, uh, that were highly polished for this engine. Uh, something that went on until 1976. After that, all these rockers were not, no longer polished. I can argue whether that does anything, the polishing, but it's nice if you unscrew the valve cover to see polished parts in there. Uh, they, these rockers uh, are being uh, actuated by a specially designed camshaft, also specific for the 1974 Supersport, as that is the only round case engine that uses desmodromic valve actuation, specific valve uh, actuating by this camshaft, specific for this model. Uh, apart from that, the heads are based still on the same castings as were used on the 750 GT and Sport, but specific are the valve and the, the valves and the, how they are operated. So the crankshaft design was directly taken from the earlier GT and Sport version, but the conrods were specific for the 1974 Super Sport, and these were beautifully machined forged steel conrods made in-house by Ducati on their Olivetti computerized CNC uh, machine. And uh, Ducati was very proud of these, as they should be, because they're beautifully made conrods fitted to these 750 Super Sports in 1974 and specific for this model year only. Gearbox as well is the same as we used on the 750 GT and Sport. Nothing changed here for the Super Sport and that is actually how this engine was constructed. And another specific item for the 1974 Super Sport were these carburetors made by Delorto. Now Ducati wanted to fit 40 millimeter carburetors for the first time on their newly designed V-twin, uh, but Delorto didn't have 40 millimeter carburetors in their program. They did have the new PHM model uh, carburetor available only in 38 and 36 millimeters. And uh, that is why they took the 38 PHM and hand stamped them after being uh, machined up to 40 millimeters, uh, hand stamped the 40 after PHM on the body. These carburetors are specific for the 1974 Super Sport, as they don't have a provision for the choke body. So you cannot fit a choke on these. Uh, they're just made to uh, tickle, and that is how the extra fuel is in there for starting. But other than that, there's no provision for a choke. Uh, uh, but that was done on the later versions where this was casted into the body uh, so that a choke provision could be added. So, specific carburetors for the 1974 Super Sport green frame. And that makes for a complete engine, a green frame engine. Uh, a lot of things specific and uh, used for the first time on this engine in 1974. And of course, that is what makes this bike so special, is that engine. Of course, engine numbers are also a specific range of numbers that were used uh, in the production run. And it is also a way to identify whether we're talking about a correct, a real Super Sport or a fake one using 750 GT or Sport cases. Although the cases are the same, the number of sequence of this 750 Super Sport is specific. Even more specifics can be told about the rolling chassis of this bike. Starting with the frame, of course, which was based on that of the 750 Sport of the 1973 model year but with some changes here and there to fit the different bodywork of the 750 Super Sport. Basically, it's the same frame as used before, the narrow frame as introduced on the 1973 Super, uh, 750 Sport, and of course painted in that wonderful green bluish color that was so famous and was now the whole reason we refer to these bikes as being a green frame. Wheels and tires were also specific for this model year. They included a set of Borani 18-inch wheels with a specific inscription 
that was only used and only been found on the 750 of 1974. Front and rear are the same and the same tires were fitted front and rear. Ducati was looking for a tire that was suitable of the top speed of this bike of being 210 kilometers an hour. The only tire manufacturer that was able to supply a tire capable of that top speed in 1974 was Metzler. And that is why this Block C7 tires were fitted back in the day. Now, unfortunately, Metzler stopped making that specific tire, uh, which is why we chose to fit uh, all three of these restorations with a slightly different tire, also from Metzler, but it's the Block C5. So it's the closest we can get to that originally fitted tire. The front brake system was supplied by Scarab, and it's the only Ducati with a dual disc setup from Scarab. Later versions received the Brembo, of course, but in 1974 it was exclusively made by Scarab. And uh, for that they have to supply a left and right version of that brake caliper. There were three different types of uh, calipers available, and you see them throughout the uh, range of uh, Super Sports. Uh, they were supplied interchangeably. One only featured the name Scarab on the outer casting. Others include the uh, Ducati logo on there, and there's a third version with Scarab Mozi Moto. But all three are basically the same calipers, and uh, you often see them left and right, even different on, a, uh, on original bikes. Also supplied by Scarab was this front master cylinder, and it's also a specific model for the Super Sport, as it's the only one with a uh, stop switch uh, for the rear brake light at the end of that master cylinder. And that is what makes this master cylinder so unique again for the 74 Super Sport. Scarab was not able to supply a rear brake system for the 750 Super Sport in 74. And that is why Ducati went to Lockheed, uh, a supplier they used on models earlier than this, to supply the rear brake system. And that is why we find a Lockheed caliper and master cylinder on the rear of the bike. The front fork was supplied by Marzocchi. It's a 38 millimeter front fork, basically the same as we've seen on bikes earlier and later, but also specific for the 74. And that is because the mountings are for the Scarab uh, brake calipers. The axle, front axle going in from the right side with the calipers mounted forward, as you see here. And also uh, this mudguard is fitted with two screws on either side, making it so that the studs for holding the front mudguard to the front fork is done with two studs. So the latest have four. These specific for the 74 Super Sport have two studs per side. The rear shocks are 307 millimeter in length and are also supplied by Marzocchi. They are shared with the 1974 Sport, the same item as on the Super Sport of that year, uh, but specific for this model year, only found on this model year, with a three-way adjusting for the uh, spring preload and the top cap with the rubber mount that you see here. So the dashboard was new for 74 and specific for the Super Sports as well. So on the dashboard layout, we have the tachometer and the speedometer with odometer inside. And then we have three idiot lights, one that is always on when there is power to the ignition. That's the white one. Then the green one telling you whether the lights are on and the red one telling you if the high beam is on. And the light is switched with this switch right here. The electrical system is based on that of the 750 GT and Sport and is largely the same. Point ignition that is housed in this section here, plates with uh, points and two condensers uh, right there and they give a signal to two ignition coils that are mounted underneath the tank and they take power from the battery that is fitted behind this cover. Battery is charged with an alternator that is inside this area of the engine. Power goes to a regulator fitted on the left side of the frame, again powering the battery. Apart from that whole system, uh, it only has a headlight, a taillight, a stop switch uh, for the brakes, front and rear, and a horn. And that's about it on the electrical uh, part. Uh, there's not much else that needs any electrics on this, on this bike. All the electrics come together in a fuse box that is fitted underneath the seat. There's also a specific item on some 750 Super Sports, not all of them, but that is that the cover on that fuse box is made with a wood grain. Uh, you cannot come up with it if you were to develop a bike like that, but that actually this one has it, the wood grain fuse box cover. So um, the ignition switch is on this side of the frame and two keys are with that, one spare of course, and that is how you 
switch on the ignition on the bike. So, like I said, the horn, that's working. <laughs> the bodywork parts were actually all specific for the 750 Super Sport of 1974, although the mud was shared with the 1975 model year. Uh, but at least it was new in 74. Front mudguard specific for the 750 of 1974. Like we talked about, it's a two stud uh, mount on the front fork. Then the fairing is specific as well. Also shared in 75, but it's uh, slightly wider at the bottom than the later fairing that was used from 1976 onwards. And the fuel tank again was new in 74 and uh, was based on that of the uh, Imola racing bike that we talked about. Basically the same shape, some differences, but at least it was modeled after that famous racing bike. Same goes with the seat, uh, which was also new in 74 and differed from the 750 Sport as it has the zipper on the upholstery to reach the compartment there. But other than that, it is new for 74. Side covers are also based on that of the 750 Sport, but Slightly different, slightly uh, thinner. The rear mudguard is the same as on a 750 Sport, albeit painted, of course. That was the case on the 750 in 1974. It was the first of the twins that was fully painted with fiberglass bodywork all around, uh, which was supplied by Roberto Balanti uh, company to Ducati in uh, yellow, same color as the 750 Sport but painted silver, of course, with the green on the fairing and the stripe that goes along the middle in that famous green, the same color that was used on that frame. Of course, the 750 Super Sport of 1974, it is, well, like we said, the holy grail, perhaps, of motorcycling when we're talking about the uh, historic models. At least we think here that all of the details should be correct in order for a bike to pass a certain judgment of originality. And that is why we take so much care into getting all these details right and making sure that the bikes are now finished in a way that they were actually when they were leaving the factory back in 1974. So there's a lot of talk about a lot of specifics. There are even more to discuss, uh, which we will not bother you with. Uh, if you want to know more, please make sure to comment in uh, this uh, section below and we will be uh, sure to answer any questions about the uh, specifics of this, this model year. But um, that's about what we can tell you right now about this, the specifics of this model. Let's talk about each of these projects a little bit more. First up is this one. We call it a rattle can for reasons we'll get into later. This bike was originally supplied to the US, to the state of uh, Michigan, where it was bought new. And uh, we have pictures of this bike in 1980 already, where it was painted red. And it was painted red with a, a rattle can, hence the name. And it was done in a rather crude way because the guy, owner at the time, went to the hardware store, bought a rattle can with red paint and started spraying at the front. And by the time he reached about half of the fuel tank, his can was empty. He went to another hardware store to buy another can of red paint in a slightly different color and went on painting it until it was empty by the, uh, this area here and then bought a third can of red paint to finish off the last bit. So it was in a array of different shades of red when this bike was uh, brought to us from the US. Apart from that hideous paint job it received, it was a rather original condition. Uh, there was an exhaust missing and there was some damage to the dashboard, but we were able to all correct that. Of course, uh, we rebuilt this bike from the ground up, full engine rebuilt. Uh, all documented so that it, uh, we are absolutely 100% sure about the complete originality of this bike. And it turned out to be a wonderful project. Going further, a project where we can even tell you a little bit more about. We call this the number, uh, for reasons again we will get into. This bike is not very known as it comes to the history. It was probably supplied to Italy where it was raced back in the 1970s. That is why we think the original engine with this frame was uh, not, no longer with the bike at the time that it was restored, rather crudely, again, probably back in the 1980s or 90s. We don't know for sure. Uh, but at least the bike was brought to us with a engine number that was not correct. You could, we could see on the, with the stampings, people trying to fit a sort of stamp an engine number in there, not in the correct way at all. Uh, and also that number appeared 
on several of the registries that are being kept of these uh, 750 Supersports. Again, because this bike is so much sought after, some registries exist uh, of people uh, writing down the numbers of bikes that they came to see or are known in the classic uh, Ducati world. Uh, so this was a big, big question mark with this bike, especially the engine number. Frame number, on the other hand, was correct, and you could see that that was not fiddled with in any way. Uh, it was the way it should be from the factory. And that frame number only appeared once in all of these registries. So how could we go about making this bike better? Luckily, we were able to source a set of cases with 750 Supersport numbers. That was quite remarkable, uh, because these cases are not to be picked up anywhere. But we were able to supply a set of uh, cases with a correct number in the sequence of the 1974 Supersport range. So, it might not be the engine number that this bike left the factory with. At least it is an original number, or stamped originally to these cases. It doesn't appear twice or anything else in, inside any registry. So it's the only engine in existence with this number. And it is in the sequence that is correct. So at least this bike now with a original frame number, original engine number, again was completely restored to the same specifications as the other two, and the same specifications as they left the factory. So this one is now in, sort of, in, in a way saved from uh, having to deal with a dodgy engine number. And now 100% correct again. That about the second project, and then we go to the third project. And this one we refer to as the Corfu, and that is because this bike was originally supplied to the island of Corfu in Greece, probably the only one that went to that island at the time. There were more supplied to Greece, uh, not too many, but at least one on the island of Corfu. This bike was kept together quite well, spent a life in Greece, but was very early on in its life, it was painted in 1975 color scheme. Uh, because that was probably the new model and it had to be looked a little bit like the new model that was out uh, now from Ducati. So it received silver frame and blue and silver bodywork. Uh, of course, diverting it from the original as it was supplied by the factory. It then was restored. Again, we think about it in the uh, late 90s, early uh, 2000s. Again, rather in, in a rather crude way, the owner of the bike never was very happy with the finish. And also uh, uh, the known fact that the uh, set of Conrads that were fitted to this bike was not the original type we talked about earlier. And a few other bits and pieces that were not correct, like the shade of green that was chosen uh, for the paint of the frame. So it was decided to get this bike sorted and make sure that every little detail was correct on this as well. Here we were able to fit a set of original Conrads to the crankshaft, rebuild the engine, uh, all to the correct specifications as they were in 74. Full repaint, as with the other two projects, obviously. And again, this one uh, was built up with 100% correct specifications from start to finish. So a lot of mistakes, you could call it, uh, or perhaps people weren't paying attention to it that much back in uh, the late 1990s when these bikes were still valuable, but not as valuable as they are today. Uh, but at least we corrected all of these things with this restoration project. 20 polar bears got killed making this t-shirt. Anyway, so we have a nice giveaway for you guys and that is this wonderful t-shirt of a 750 green frame. Now what you need to win this t-shirt is to go down to the comment section below this video and write your favorite green frame story. And now by the time the 31st of October, uh, when we uh, feature a video on that date, we will announce the winner uh, of the best green frame story uh, comment below this video. And that guy will win this t-shirt. Or woman, but likely a guy. Yeah. So the 750 Supersport green frame. Today regarded as one of the most iconic bikes, especially of the 1970s, but you could argue among the greatest motorcycles ever produced. Compared to its rivals of the 1970s, you have to first think about the MV Agusta uh, 750, First the S and later the uh, S America. Compared to that, I am absolutely convinced that the 750 Supersport is the 
a better motorcycle in uh, every regard, especially if you look at the frame and the setup of that, the whole the chassis and how it responds. Uh, this is nothing compared to what that MV Agusta could make at the time. Bearing in mind that the MV Agusta obviously uh, was made not to compete on the racetrack, where this absolutely was the case uh, to be used on the racetrack. Another great rival of the 750 green frame was the uh, 750 SFC by Laverda. Also, beautiful bike, that must be certainly said when it comes to handling, uh, perhaps one that comes uh, close and can hold a candle to the 750 Supersport. From my experience, it is by far not as easy to ride as a uh, Ducati 750. And that engine, the 750 engine of Ducati, is way more powerful and, and much better equipped for a racing bike than the uh, Laverda type. So, if you look at the 750 Supersport back in the 1970s, this really was a non plus ultra uh, racing bike for the road compared to many of its rivals at the time. Uh, you could even argue, and that I often see with customers driving a, uh, any bevel drive for the first time, in fact, is that even compared to modern motorcycles, this will keep up in many, many ways. I'm not saying that it is as good as modern motorcycles. It doesn't have the power output, obviously, of a modern Panigale racing bike. It doesn't have the suspension, it doesn't have the brakes, but many people they think of these bikes as being old and uh, of an era that is past already. Uh, that might be true, but you will be amazed with how good these bikes actually ride today, even compared to many modern bikes. So the press, they were very enthusiastic uh, on the whole about this bike, the 750 Supersport, back in 74. They saw the importance of this bike, uh, not only as uh, the forefront of what Ducati could offer, but also the importance of this bike for the motorcycle industry as a whole. Today, the 750 Supersport green frame is among the rarest and most sought after bikes out there. And you see that reflected in uh, prices in well within six figures uh, when it comes to well looked after examples, uh, especially original ones, but also uh, or examples like these that have been uh, restored in a good way and uh, with all the details that are correct. Now, if you compare it with uh, uh, other markets like the uh, classic car market, this is uh, really still a bargain because you have to really compare it with the likes of the Ferrari 250 or uh, a Porsche uh, 911 2.7 RS. Cars like that that are really, really sought after. Prices for these are in a, a, a whole different ball game than when we're talking about this type of motorcycle. But still, it is among the uh, most sought after motorcycles out there and uh, rightly so, in my opinion, because uh, these bikes, they were really special back in the day. Of course, throughout the years, it was always known that these bikes were something special, uh, but only in the last few decades, appreciation of these bikes came to uh, what it uh, should be. And that is very well seen in how much attention these bikes deserve these days. Now, unfortunately, we were planning on riding these bikes out uh, on the road, but today being in Holland, of course, the weather turned on us and it is absolutely dreadful outside. So we're not going to take these very expensive and just restored bikes out in the rain. The video wouldn't be nice anyway, but we promise you to have a uh, video about me riding one of these bikes out in a few days. This video was jam-packed with information about the 750 Supersport green frame of 1974. A lot for you to chew on, uh, that we realize. Uh, but give us your favorite green frame story down in the comments. And we of course have that t-shirt uh, to give away to the, uh, the best comment out there. So be sure to check that out. Also, like and subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel. So you get notifications whenever we have something new out there. Uh, for now, this is another video done here at Back to Classics. We thank you very much for watching. Toodle doki. See you next time. <laughs>